Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session two of the China Market Entry 2022 To Go or Not To Go webinar series. Um, this is a four day workshop that Manfred and I have created to help companies get over the pain barrier of understanding whether they should be actually setting up operations in China or not. Um, and when we say setting up operations, it is actually hiring people on the ground, setting up physical structures, etc. Um, we have done or we've created a three day informational session. And on Thursday, we are actually going to be doing a live Q&A mastermind, where the goal of that session will be to create um, an action plan for the next 90 days so that you have the ability to move forward. If you missed yesterday's session, session one, it was all about data gathering, right? What is your market share? What is your market potential? What do your competitors look like? If you were not able to view yesterday's session, my recommendation would be to go to our YouTube channel and get a review of that so that it all makes sense from day to day. Um, and that link is already, it's already up. It's up on our YouTube channel. The information is there, the recording is there. And if you've got any questions on that, don't hesitate to, to reach out. Before we start today's session, just how the webinar works, Manfred and I are here this week to educate you, to teach you. We like it when people are interacting with us. We can help you more if you interact and ask questions, make comments, et cetera, et cetera, share your experiences, all right? We prefer not to be interrupted as we're speaking. Um, we do have slides to show you. So there is a Q&A at the end, which will be a first come first serve principle. Um, but again, we really want the questions to come on um, on Thursday as we're doing this, this live Q&A, all right? Chat box is open. Put all your questions in there and we will get them answered, all right? We are using Zoom meeting. Manfred is my co-host. So if anything happens on my side, he'll take over. If anything happens on his side, I will take over. It usually always takes about a minute to a minute and a half to reboot the whole system, um, but at least we're protected on either side of, of continuing the presentation. If anything happens on your side, please just try to log off, log back in. Um, that's all I can say. I can't really help you if I'm presenting. Manfred really can't help you if he's not looking at your computer. So um, just know we are recording today's session and you can look back at that later on, all right? This is going to be an hour of your time spend. Use it wisely, ask questions. And the goal is we're gonna help you to create this action plan along the way. Now, there are not everybody that joined yesterday's session um, is on here. So for those of you that didn't interact with us yesterday, are you a newbie or are you a startup? If you can just write that in the chat box, newbie startup, how we define newbies, it's those of you that have found opportunities in China, you're evaluating those opportunities and you're trying to gain an understanding of whether you need an operation on the ground in China physically or not. Startups would be those of you that have transacted with China for about one to three years. And now you're trying to understand if you're at a scale big enough to have an on the ground structure and start hiring headcount, all right? So again, in the chat box, newbie, startup. Great, thank you, Simona. Thank you, Steven, Fred, fantastic. Um, again, all of these interactions are really there to help me to guide also this presentation that I'll be doing today. So what are we covering? So for those of you that missed this yesterday, we are yesterday talked about the importance of understanding your data. Why will data be important to you to make decisions along your China journey? We were looking at market share, value proposition, competitors. Today, we're going to be looking at China business models and the financial resources that are needed to get into China, okay? This is a big topic. I've downsized it into a 40 minute presentation. I've done my best but it will give you an overview of what is possible and what types of structures you can create. And tomorrow we're gonna to be talking about an empowering ecosystem and what does that actually mean, okay? Who do you need to support your business in China? We can't go to China alone, nobody can. So who do you need in your environment, either third parties, in-house people that are gonna support and grow your business? And like I said, on Thursday, what will be your three action points in the next 90 days to get the ball rolling? 
if China is really a market that you want to get into and grasp that opportunity and the data is telling you to do it, then what will be your next reaction points? So the conclusion of yesterday was, if you don't have data at your fingertips, what data do you need? And don't just write data, be specific. Is it brand awareness? Is it competitor pricing? Is it competitor benchmarking? Is it market segmentation? Is it understanding what your value proposition is? What data do you already have? And what data do you actually need to make concrete decisions moving forward? Again, we'll review that on Thursday. Just a brief intro to who I am. My name is Christina kohler Lucia. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Um, I didn't update my slide, but I do have 18 years of experience in corporate services and corporate compliance, um, having gone into the market in end of 03. Um, I've helped over 500 companies with their pre-investment advisory, their um, strategy development, their strategy implementation. And for me now, actually the most fun part of the job is helping these companies scale up in the market and how to improve their efficiencies, how to improve their processes to get ahead of the game. A lot of the things now in China are pretty much straightforward. Complexities and many administrative functions have been eliminated, which is why I've created a whole series of methodologies on how to get your foundations right for China. And if you're just interested, we've got an ebook, which is the 10 biggest mistakes companies make in China. This is the 10 biggest mistakes I think companies make in China. Um, just a disclaimer there. Um, and if you want a copy of that, you can email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com. And before we start the presentation today, I do want to hand over to Manfred to just quickly introduce himself as well. Hello, everybody again, who's been there yesterday. Uh, it's been, been a pleasure, a pleasure again today. My name is Manfred. Uh, similar as Christina, I entered China in 2003, um, went up to northeastern China, to Beijing, to Shanghai, um, has uh, a lot of experience in the field of uh, project management, especially in, in technical areas, going up to large scale um, projects of about 100 million euros. And uh, since uh, 2015, we are supporting our clients uh, to find the right people in China. It is about finding the right uh, leadership personnel, but as well as the, the experts. And uh, I think always it's about having the right people and having the right team, but especially with that distance of 8,000, 9,000 kilometers, depending on where you are located, um, it is even more important and also adding COVID, you know, if you don't have the right team, things, things get trickier. So I think that's, that's enough uh, so far from my end. Christina, back Thanks. to you. Thank um, you, Manfred. I'll, I'll be here. All right. So the topic for today is, again, China business models and the financial resources needed to get in. There is no magic number and there is no magic structure. It all comes down to how much risk you're willing to take and how much commitment you're willing to make in the Chinese market, okay? So risk and commitment. Now, one thing that I also always tell clients is, is if you do not have the time resources available to spend to push this China project forward, don't go in. Pardon my language, but if you do things half-assed, it's not gonna work. You have to be committed to the Chinese market and to the development and growth of it in order to make it right, which means that you have to have the ability to spend time on a daily basis with the team in China or with the distributors in China, logistics providers in China, whomever, whoever is in your ecosystem. You need to either have a team of people in your HQ or yourself managing those relationships to be able to succeed. So time is of the essence. And the other is the financial resources. You can create whatever business model you want. You can create a phased approach to getting into China, but if you don't have those financial resources available at your fingertips, nothing is going to work. And I just wanna reiterate here, China is no longer the cheap country we thought of 18 years ago. Salaries are higher. Cost of living is higher. Office rent is higher, especially when you're looking at the tier one cities, all right? So if you don't have these financial resources at your fingertips, 
then now is not the right time for you to get into China until you do have those resources readily available. Now there have been questions in the uh, in the registration report about getting financing and, and, and investors and all of that. So I'll touch on that a little bit as the presentation goes on. All right, here are the business models. I've got two pages. I've got um, 10 options available to you in terms of how you can structure your business. Now, obviously for Manfred and I, what is always interesting is if you actually establish something on the ground, because that helps you to scale up at a much faster pace than if you're doing things direct from your head office. Um, you're just not gonna get the same uh, speed of market to push things forward. But I've given you all of these options. So option one is direct sales. You can consider that whole, direct wholesales or cross-border e-commerce. And obviously you can do that direct from your HQ. You don't need to have an entity on the ground. However, you will need to have an ecosystem of providers that support this business. That's logistics providers, TPs. If you don't know what a TP is, a TP is a, um, it stands for Tmall Partner, but nowadays they are basically TPs that help you with all different e-commerce platforms. And they are the operational arm of your e-commerce business in China. Um, you might need branding agencies. You might need PR agencies. You might need import export agents. There is a whole category that you might need in your ecosystem to get you off the ground, all right? But direct sales is one possibility. Minimum risk, minimum investment. Option two is using trade intermediaries. And what I mean by this is using distributors, right? Or sales agents. Using distributors is, is great. It's a great first step. If you choose to use that option, then do me a favor and vet them. Vet them properly. Do a due diligence on them. Understand who their existing clients are. Understand what their financial capabilities are understand what they're good at and what they're not good at. We have clients who use distributors who say they are a one-stop shop concept, but in the end, they're horrible at branding and they're horrible at marketing, all right? So understand their abilities and categorize those abilities from a grade of one to 10 to understand what you should outsource to them and what you should maybe think about doing in-house or outsource to another provider. Christina. Go ahead, Manfred. May I shortly, especially um, on the point of the distributors that Christina just brought up, you know, um, what we're seeing a lot is you, you go with a distributor and then you marry them, meaning you give them a three year or five year contract, whatever you can, you can always, you know, shift, meaning you can start with distributors and then start to set up your own entity that reduces your risks. But, you know, along the, the thoughts of Christina, vet them and also give them targets. You know, don't give them the whole Chinese market for free. If you have awesome products, um, separate them in regions, give them, you know, performance targets to move on, that kind of thing. Um, that makes your life much, 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 much easier. Yeah, create exit strategies. Break up, yeah. break, break up clauses, basically, in these contracts. <laughs> that just leads me to another point. Make sure you have contracts. Not everything should be written in emails and be verbal confirmations. The next two options are not as popular because it really will come down to your product and what your goals and objectives are in China and what maybe your goals and objectives are on a global scale. But using licensees and using franchisees is just simply another option. Um, again, vet these partners, do your due diligence, make sure you've got concrete exit clauses available in case you want to um, go through a divorce or separate from them. Don't put all your eggs in one basket when you're working with these partners. Option five is using an employer of record service. So what this option actually means is you're not establishing an entity in China, but you're using an intermediary, um, which is called the employer, it's a PO uh, organization, where you offer the employer of record service. So this intermediary in China has the ability to hire employees on your behalf who will work full time for you on the ground. This just means that you don't have to put in the full commitment about setting up an entity, running that entity, operating that entity, 
and doing all of the administrative work that that entails. But you may find that you're using a distributor who's rubbish in marketing. And so you actually want to hire a marketing manager who takes care of all the branding initiatives and activities, but you don't have an entity to hire them with. Well, then you can use an employer of record company that hires this employee on your behalf. You choose them, this company employs them, and they work full time on your behalf, right? It's like an employment uh, intermediary option. This is a great phased approach. And I'll provide you with a case study so that you can put all of these options really in a clear outline. The next option, and this was a question that was in the registration report by one of the registrants, is using Hong Kong or Singapore as your Asian hub to get into China. Very simply put, Hong Kong is not China. Singapore is not China. There are still borders that you have to abide by. Um, and although you know, um, the language is similar, although Hong Kong is Cantonese, not Mandarin, um, it's still not the same jurisdiction. So that's the disadvantage. However, if you're trying to make a soft landing to get into China, and you're worried about the commitment and investment that it will take, of course, you can set up a Hong Kong company that acts as your Asian hub that you will use to transact. But then my follow-up question on that will be, does this Hong Kong company need people? And where will those people be based? Will they be based in Hong Kong? Will they be based in China? If you have a Hong Kong company, it cannot hire people that are then residing in mainland China. Hong Kong is still separate from China, all right? This is a question that pops up quite frequently because people are not ready to commit to mainland China. They're ready to commit to Hong Kong, um, but then they want people on the ground in China. That does not work. That solution does not work, okay? Now, I will say Hong Kong, Singapore, or any other Asian jurisdiction you wanna use to then get into China, keep in mind one, it's not China. And then also keep in mind too, that these companies need to be operational. You will come into double taxation issues, um, uh, ownership structure issues, uh, res uh, place of effective management issues. If these entities are purely holding companies because you're not willing to take that risk to get into the Chinese market. So it can also lead to other issues. You have to be very clear on what you're using these entities for, okay? <clears throat> Option seven is setting up a representative office in China. I should have written in China, sorry. It's setting up a representative office in China. Now for me, representative offices are useless. They give you no advantage, especially if in the long term you're looking to be fully operational in China. Representatives are liaison offices. You cannot trade with these entities. You cannot sign contracts with these entities. They are purely a liaison office giving you an office space in China, allowing you to hire people, but giving you no operational flexibility in terms of contracts, transactions, et cetera. It's purely a cost center, which is why I say it's useless. Now, depending on what sector and industry you're in, representative offices may be useful. If you are in the real estate industry and you are trying to sell properties that are based abroad to Chinese investors, then by all means, have a marketing office in China where you show these properties because the transactions will always be direct anyhow. So again, there could be some use, but it really comes down to your industry and sector and what your goals and objectives are. Option eight is setting up a 100% foreign owned limited company. Now, some of you might know the terms woofy and feist. I hate those terms. I hate them. Because people are like, yeah, we're setting up a woofy. And I'm like, no, you're setting up a limited liability company. Like, no, 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 it's a woofy. Yeah, because it's wholly foreign owned limited company. All right. So get away from the ideas of these terms of woofy and vice. Anyway, all of the laws in relation to uh, corporate business have been unified. We're now using the terms limited company. Okay which means that it's owned 100% by a foreign investor, foreign shareholder, all right? These entities mean that you can trade, you can transact, whether it is trading products, trading in services, 
whether you are setting up a restaurant, a recruitment company, an accounting firm, uh, an interior design firm, or whether you're actually physically trading, wholesaling, or selling to consumers products. It can also be a manufacturing company, an R&D center, however you want to create it. But it's owned 100% by a foreign shareholder. Option nine is setting up a joint venture, which means that there is a foreign party and a local party. Now, I don't wanna to be too negative about joint ventures, but I do have a lawyer friend of mine, a very good friend of mine who um, calls this the joint venture infection. There are a lot of foreign lawyers and foreign corporate service providers who will steer you away from doing any form of joint venture just because we have seen too many horrible divorces. And if you can go it alone, we would recommend you to go it alone so you have full control over your organization. If you add Chinese investors into this structure, you have to understand whether these are gonna be silent investors or whether they will actually take an active role in the business, in the organization, and in the administration of the business, all right? Um, and obviously, if you are in a sector or industry that's restricted or prohibited, then ultimately you won't have any choice. You'll have to go with a local partner to, to, to help you build the structure that you wanna have on the ground, all right? Option 10 is doing a mix and match, which people sometimes don't realize. And what I wanna emphasize what, with option 10 is, you can create a phased approach to the Chinese market. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. You can start off by doing direct sales, create, create goals, create KPIs. If we achieve, I don't know, 1 million US dollars in sales, that's gonna lead us to phase two, which maybe means we'll have somebody on the ground. So you use option five, an employer of record service. If this guy achieves 2 million US dollars in sales, that's the KPI you need and the trigger you need to say, you know what, now we'll set up our own company in China. Creating this phased approach, one doesn't rush you. And I, I know I have said already yesterday and today that we need to scale up at the speed of the Chinese market. But you can do a lot of things from home. You can do things simultaneously by having somebody on the ground. And you, know, you could achieve 1 million US dollars in three months which means that in one year, you're going through three different phases of this approach. You can start off 2022 by doing direct sales. By June, you might already have a guy on the ground. And by December, you might have your own company because you've hit those trigger points. That's how fast it could go. By creating this phased approach and the idea of how are we gonna develop step-by-step, step, you're going to your board of directors, you're going to your investors, with the idea of we're gonna do things step-by-step. Step. We've created objectives, goals, KPIs at each phase, which will act as triggers to move on to the next step. Again, using trade intermediaries, using licensees, using franchises are all options. Um, allow me to give you a case study of a client of mine who is in um, um, B2C. They went into China actually using a distributor, a fantastic distributor, an American on the ground, setting up his own distribution company, having a number of different clients. He did a fantastic job, but lo and behold, he decided to retire and move back to the US. So this company was left to make a decision, find a new distributor or a new distribution network or go it alone. Having had four years of on the ground experience with this distributor and having had the opportunity to learn from this distributor, they made the decision to go it alone with the caveat that they would take two of his employees away. Anyway, he was downsizing and liquidating. So there was an opportunity to grab those two employees, bring them in and build their own business. And since then they've had their own entity. They've been able to transact. They've been able to make decisions actually swifter than going through the distributor. Because remember, distributors are intermediaries. There's always going to be this com communication conflict and also different goals and objectives by both parties. Distributors will have a different objective than you might have for the market. 
So there's different ways of attacking all of this. So I've given you the options, but remember, you need to create a tailor-made phased approach to China that is specific to how much risk do you want to take, how much commitment do you have, how much time do you have, and what financial resources do you have to get in. Okay, and please don't be surprised. China is not as cheap as it used to be. So things like salary levels are very similar to the UK, the US, Hong Kong, etc. So you've got to keep all of this in mind. Before I move on to the financial resources, Manfred, do you want to add anything on the structures or the business models? Maybe just a number because you have you have kind of given that um, that tip away a couple of of point a couple of times on, on on salary levels, you know. So, for example, because quite a few of the European companies are looking for let's say technical sales managers, we're just hiring one technical sales manager in Shanghai, um, probably coming in at at four hundred thousand RMB, so that would be about fifty thousand euros, um, a bit more than forty thousand pounds. Um, in Suzhou out, we're taking one that's having a bit more responsibility, probably even going up to 600,000 RMB. Um, just two numbers kind of for operational salespeople. When it comes to, you know, general managers of, of sales organizations for whatever sort of things, we're, we're starting and that probably is really uh, as low as you can get at 800,000 RMB, which is 100,000 euros. And then depending on whether it's Chinese or whether it's European, you're probably going up to a level of about 2 million RMB, uh, which is 250,000 euros. So just to give you a couple of, of numbers on the ballpark, I think we can and will revisit the topic partially tomorrow. Um, but just that people have some numbers in mind. Of course, everybody understands with these numbers, you can always go cheaper. Um, the question is just, you know, who, who will actually perform for what you are paying them? Um, yeah, but that's just at that point. Um, thank you, Christina. Thanks, Manfred. So now let's get onto the financial resources. I don't have a magic number for you all, unfortunately. I wish I could create a magic number that says with this amount, you can get into China successfully. That's impossible for me to do because it really does come in, come down to your industry, your sector, and your abilities to finance the project. Every company has different financial needs. Every single company. And there will be different financial needs that are needed in different cycles of your China journey. So the startup period is one cycle. Then you've got the stability where you kind of scale off, where maybe you don't need so much, or maybe you do because now you want to scale up further. Everybody will have different objectives and different um, growth strategies in place in terms of wanting to get into China. Financial planning is critical. And you might all say, yeah, of course, that total common sense. Of course, we need financial planning. But nobody does it. Not to the detail that you should be going into. And you create financial plans that are never validated by people that are, on the that are in the Chinese market. You're creating numbers out of thin air because you think those are the numbers that are equivalent in the UK, in the US, in Germany, but have no relevance for the Chinese market. So financial planning is the number one thing I want you to get out of this, but more importantly, having that validated by somebody or by people on the ground to look at those numbers and say, yes, you've calculated that correctly. At the end of today, um, Manfred and I had the idea of debating a little bit about the, ch the biggest challenges people have, foreign investors have going into China. This right here on this slide is one of the biggest, running out of cash. Almost everybody that I know that I've met with has run out of cash. Why? Because they don't have the right financial planning in place. 
And then for some reason in China, they don't build up boundaries. We were using, Manfred and I were using this word earlier. Don't build up boundaries to say no to things. Opportunities are gonna fall at your doorstep left and right. You're gonna meet people that you wanna hire yesterday, but you're never evaluating your financial plan together with the actual reality of your situation. Reasons for running out of cash can be anything from your clients are just simply not paying you, right? I've had clients who haven't paid me for a year. I continue to work with them. Again, I'm trying to create boundaries now, but that happens. So what are you gonna do if people don't pay you and then you don't have the cash resources to pay salaries, to pay rent, what happens if you don't listen to your lawyer and you get into administrative difficulties and then your bank account is frozen? And again, you have no ability to pay people, pay things, pay suppliers, pay third parties. What happens if you're buying and selling locally and your suppliers, you have no cash available to pay them, so your suppliers take legal action against you? What happens if you can't pay your logistics provider and they decide not to release your goods? Financing your business in China is critical. And I want to talk a little bit about scenario planning. May okay. I shortly hear, Christina? Sure, go ahead, Manfred. Um, you know, Christina and myself, but also everybody else inside the China community, we always face these kind of looks on, on the faces that I see now, where, you know, we state something that is very obvious and very clear, um, but just kind of to confirm what Christina just said, we're having a client uh, that just hired us and that is uh, hired us to actually, he's using that face, the mixed approach that Christina talked about. Um, they are hiring the first guy on the ground and they are trying to pay us out of China. And because they don't know yet the local game and how it's played, you know, uh, they don't manage to pay for what, for five or for six weeks. Uh, and now we're coming in that part of the project where we told them, look, guys, you know, if you're unable to pay, then it's, it's also for us unable to actually find the time to do the work. So there is so many of these small things that is related to um, currencies being this is very strict. China is very strict on transferring currencies out of China. Um, and there is a lot of these small things in place that unless you've experienced them, you'll just shake your head and say, ah, that's blocks. I don't think it's actually there. But after you've experienced them, you, you, you kind of have this, you know, painful knot on your face, which says, yes, I've, I've been through something similar. So please pay attention to these details, because especially if it's 8,000 kilometers and you're not there, um, that's what breaks your neck. It's, it's not the mountains that, that you see in, in full daylight. Exactly. So coming to that point, scenario building is very important for your financial planning. And again, you can create a financial plan, you can create a budget, you could have thought of all the nitty gritty details, but then what happens if, dot, dot, dot? What happens if your customers don't pay you? What happens if you can't pay your suppliers? What happens if, dot, dot, dot? Create these scenarios and have backup plans in case you don't have cash. Cash is king in China. If you don't have that money sitting in your bank account, I mean, I've had clients, embarrassingly enough, who have not been able to pay salaries, not because they don't actually have cash. They, they do, they just can't get it in. There are obstacles, as Manfred said, getting money out of China is also complex, not impossible, it's just complex, um, that you need to have these backup plans available. If you don't have the cash readily available on the ground to pay your employees, what's your backup plan? Because you want to retain these people. These are the life, this is these people or these, you know, these third parties or these employees are the life source for you to get the ball rolling and scaling up. And if you don't plan your finances properly, you cannot get this done. You're going to have consistent obstacles and roadblocks along the way. Okay. Now, there are ways of increasing capital, getting intercompany financing and all of that. I don't wanna go into all of these details. Um, I just wanna tell you there are these options available, but everything in China associated with bank accounts, 
takes time and tremendous amount of patience. Okay, it is not an immediate transfer saying, okay, today I send from the UK into my China bank account 50,000 pounds and voila. No, 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 no. That process in itself will take two weeks because of all of the administrative measures you need to do on the ground in China to release those funds into your bank account. Vice versa, getting money out, applications have to happen on the ground, taxes have to be paid, bank applications have to be made before money can go out. It's complex, it's tedious. For me now, it's a routine. I know that there's a systematic process to get things done, to bring money in, to bring money out, and to operate the bank account locally. I know it because I'm so fixated on administrative processes and standard operating procedures. But you have to have make sure you've got backup plans and make sure you've really got this budget on. So what are your financing options? And, and again, there's not enough time to go through every single option here in tremendous detail. But I just want to give you the idea of what is available to get money into China um, and to be able to then use that money to fund your business to start up your operations. So in China, you've got something called registered capital. When you set up your operation locally, you have, um, you, you might call it an investment loan in the Western world. In China, you call it registered capital. Um, and uh, you bring that money into a special bank account that is registered. Um, application procedures have to be made in order to release this registered capital to be used as your, as your working capital, as your startup capital, okay? That's one option. The other option is that once you've used up that registered capital and you've got nothing left, you can use your foreign debt loan, which is the difference between your registered capital and your total investment. I'm gonna be throwing out a lot of terms here. Again, if you guys have questions on this, set up this quick strategy session between Manfred and I, and we can go into these details. But you have this foreign debt loan that is a, what I, I always, I nickname it emergency funds that would be available in case you haven't properly calculated your registered capital and you need to get money in. Then you've got debt financing. And the question is, where do you get that debt from? Is it from local banks? Is it from overseas banks? Is it from new investors? Where are those investors based and this will all then lead into how you structure your business because the banks might dictate or the investors might dictate what type of structure you should be establishing. Option four is services. You can create service agreements between your head office and the Chinese entity that have taxes applicable to them but allows you to get money in and it is the fastest way to get money in. Okay. The disadvantage on that, as I said, is the fact that there is a tax liability component on option four. Option one, two, three, there are no tax liabilities. Option four, there is. So you need to take that into consideration. But again, we, ha we have to make sure there are backup plans in case we run out of money. Now, again, this might be all very common sense to you, how to set up and maintain a budget for your China operation. Because of course, everybody should be setting up a budget. It's just how detailed should you be going? You need to calculate your costs in China. So costs of goods sold, costs of services. Analyze that in detail. Speak to your suppliers and your providers about what they are going to charge. And as a tip, don't just go with the first one. I actually, funnily enough, had a client who um, had a very bad experience in China not being able to communicate with certain providers because of language barriers. And when I introduced him, <laughs> to a new provider that was fluent in English. He's like, okay, I'm ready to sign the agreement now. And I said, no, stop, we're, we're visiting two others. And he was like, Christina, I got so excited being able to speak and communicate with a provider in China. And I was like, but we have to compare costs. When you are calculating your costs, have an internal rule that you need to speak to at least three different providers to understand what is the market rate for that specific service, whether it's logistics providers, TPs, whomever, all right? Make sure you are comparing providers and their costs and their service levels and their added value. Calculating your expenses in China. 
and again, we might touch on this again tomorrow with Manfred, but I'm going to give you a very easy, easy example. Salaries. Most of the time, people only budget the gross salary and forget to put in social insurance and housing fund. And then they Google social insurance and housing fund, and they, make, they, they take the average rate for China. Just to make you aware, every city has different rates for social insurance and housing fund. You need to know where you're setting up, what is the hukou of your employee to understand what are the rates that are gonna be applicable to them. And then you put that in your budget. So that's just a very simple example of how people can forget to put in critical aspects of expenses into their budgets. And what's also very important is to analyze your cash output. When are you going to be paying these expenses? At what point in the month are you going to be paying these expenses? Because it's all about cash control and making sure you've got enough in your bank account. Calculating co your costs and expenses is relatively simple in that you have suppliers, third parties that can help and guide you. Estimating your revenue can only come from the data that you generate in yesterday's session, all right? Um, and obviously there are going to be also um, providers like TPs who will help you a lot with forecasting of sales um, and things like that, but you need to estimate your revenue. And on this point, I just wanna say, be conservative. We all know there's great opportunities in China, but we need to calm down and be realistic in the numbers that we put in the revenue levels, all right? And again, estimating your revenue is something that's very difficult. I find that difficult year on year, um, but again, data research is going to be able to give you that estimate number. Reviewing your cash flow in China, again, critical. A lot of people are fixated on P&Ls, balance sheets, and whatnot. Analyze when money will be coming in and money will be going out of your bank account and do that at least as a minimum for the first 12 months of your operation. And allow an ample puffer for delays. Yes, exactly. So again, backup plan. If your customers are not gonna pay you according to the time schedule that you created, what will you do? The golden rule that I have on what are the financial resources that you need is stay conservative. Highball your expenses and prepare for low sales. And when I say low sales, I don't necessarily mean that you're not selling enough. It could just mean that you're not getting the money in time. All right. So be extremely conservative on this. You want to be prudent in your financial decisions. You don't want to get into situations where it's embarrassing because you can't pay your rent and you might be getting kicked out of your office space. You can't pay salaries, which for me is the most embarrassing aspect because you are hiring these first employees who are there because they're excited to build up your business and scale it up, but you can't pay them. And they're putting in blood and sweat. Trust me. These first few hires will be staying in the office late trying to build up this business on your behalf. And if you can't pay them, you know, don't expect them to stay. Um, this payment of salaries, I've, I've hit on this four to five times because it really happens. Another aspect you have to think about is your key service providers, lawyers, accountants, headhunters, branding agencies, TPs, if you cannot pay these key people in your ecosystem, right? They're not gonna keep working with you on good faith. At some point they would have also had enough. They also have their expenses to pay for. So be prepared also if they say, we don't wanna be your lawyer anymore. Don't call us at two o'clock in the morning. You haven't paid us in 12 months, right? You've got to have these expectations that not everybody is gonna be at your beck and call. And trust me, I've heard all of the excuses. Oh, Christina, we're a startup. You know, startups suffer. You don't have to suffer as long as you get your financial planning right and you listen to the people that are advising you. 
All right. So that's the end of the discussion. Again, I've got no magic number to give you. And I want to highlight that. Nobody can give you a magic number. The idea is that you create your budget, you try to go as nitty gritty in the details as possible, and you then have those numbers validated by somebody on the ground who can help you then to support your business. Or you go that step of the employer of record service and you hire a finance manager who is sitting in China and has this background information to help you build up your budget and build up the operations of your business. The finance person should be your right wing person for the development of this business or one of your right wing men, women to run this business. So before we hit the Q&A, um, I just want to discuss, and Manfred and I, we came up with two to three different points of the biggest challenges of running an operation in China and what are the solutions to counter them. Manfred, do you want to go with number one? Um, okay, so I think one of the challenges that we that we have is simply, you know, that connection between China, the local market, and the headquarter. You know, there needs to be some sort of alignment. If you if you're operating out of the UK, if you're operating out of the EU, um, that needs to be aligned. That needs to be together, um, and then you need to bridge that gap. Of those eight nine thousand kilometers uh which is hard to bridge especially at the moment when you know you want to go to china go have fun in the quarantine um you'll be locked up for two weeks or three um christina can tell you more about that um you know it's nobody does that so it's really it's really difficult to maintain that kind of uh connection i i think I think the most important point is that you will have, if you are responsible for the China business, let's say you are head of China, you will have certain objectives, goals that are set that may be reinforced and validated by certain people on the ground, could be somebody you hired or third parties. And you are outlining these objectives and goals. And you're saying in order to achieve these, we need XYZ structure in place. And your HQ simply does not want to listen because their ideas are completely different and are not in alignment with the actual head of China or the people that are on the ground. With, with all the GMs that we're talking, all the general managers, be it, be it Chinese, be it Western, one of their biggest problems is headquarter not listening to feedback. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's normal. We're sitting in the center. We're saying we're headquarter. Who are you to tell us? You know, we, we don't put it this way. We don't speak our mind that way. But I guess that's what around. On the other hand side, you know, as, as I've shown yesterday with the bamboo, China just requires different solutions. And it's not just China. You know, you go to other um, very far away markets. It's the same thing. You, you, you need products that fit the local reality. It's all nice that you have products that work in, in, in Austria or the UK or Germany or Spain, uh, but it needs to be something that fits. And that uh, is an ongoing process. And most of the people kind of, you know, um, then say that one of the key points to actually solve that and to get it sorted really is communication. Correct. Um, that is extremely important. I, I, I'm going to give you guys a, an example of a company I'm currently working with out of Latin America, and they have great business potential in China. They have a U.S. formatted corporate governance system, meaning that every single supplier has to be vetted with bank credibility, with filling out, I cannot even tell you the amount of documents because I've done this as a supplier of theirs. Um, and the issue is, is that their system that they're using cannot read Chinese business licenses, bank certificates, nor does the system read Chinese characters. Now, I'm fortunate enough that I, we can translate everything internally and we have this capability. But one of the providers, one of the suppliers is an import export agent that has nothing in English, zero. Now, for me, being the first supplier that they ever had for the Chinese market, it took three months for my first invoice to get paid 
because the vetting process took three months. I could have easily said to them, I'm not interested in working with you anymore. If you don't pay me no. on time, I'm not interested. And I think, you know, with, with that, Christina, if I may, you know, comes, comes also some, some sort of inherent challenge. You, you grow as a company, you grow to 10 people, you grow to 50 people, you go to 3,000 people. You have certain systems and processes kind of that support your ways of doing business. On the other hand side, um, we're not saying, you know, throw away everything that you have. That's not the message. The message, however, is if you arrive in China and there's no flexibility on your end, exactly. then that will be trickier. Then you just need to, then I go back to Christina's financial planning and the cash flow analysis. Then we stretch everything, you know, to double the amount of time or to three times the amount of time. You put in three times as much financial resources, at least. But, you know, it's still people there. If you start building a team and they're seeing you suffocating them with corporate governance rules, the good ones will leave again. Why, why, why would they be staying? Why, why would they be staying is something that, that seems like, you know, a very much like a prolonged and delayed birth. Um, that, that, that doesn't work. I, I also just want to clarify, it does not mean that you shouldn't be instilling corporate governance in your China operations. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you need to adapt yourself in the headquarter to facilitate the corporate governance in China. Because China in itself does not run the same legal system, the same documentation as it does in other Western countries. I think, I think what's important on that end is, you know, the question towards your either distribution partner in China or your team in China is, you know, what do you need in order to reach these goals? That's the, the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is to actually listen. That's the hard part. Listen to them. And I think that is hard also because quite a few people in China or in Asia have the tendency not to speak in a very direct way. So in Austria, we call it salami tactic. They'll, they'll, they'll sell it to you by 21 small steps. So, you know, you need, you, you need to listen. You need to stay there to get what are they trying to say, you know? It might be that, well, we just can't sell the product and we need something completely different. Now that you've already hired me, I won't tell you that it's actually difficult to sell that product. And you need to start to, to be able to hear that sort of feedback because otherwise it's just a very long and painful process um, if, you know, if you don't take that feedback. And I also want to say you don't have to be on the ground to get that feedback. People are all like, oh, well, we'll wait till we get into China to have these conversations. Why are you wasting your time? Do them now over a Zoom conversation or over a WeChat call and you say to your staff, lay it out for me, blatantly. Be as open as possible. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get upset. We just need to be able to scale up and grow. Is it the product? Is it the price? Is it the people? Is it the third-party providers? Right? Maybe your employee is scared to tell you that actually the distributor is rubbish, but you've been working with them for 20 years. So you don't want to rock the boat, right? But if he's rubbish, then what are you doing with them, right? Listen, listen to the employees. Make them also uh, proactively make them speak to you. Give them easy questions that they have the ability to answer. And, and, and you know, on all these sorts of things, you always have one great feedback mechanism that both works and that speaks very loud. Think in a very smart way about the bonus. Don't structure the bonus in a dumb way. You know, think about what really needs to be achieved. Communicate that clearly before you hire these people. Mm. Because it, it, you know, it aligns them mm. with you, essentially. And it also pushes them to communicate and talk with you. Um, and this is, you know, one of these small things. It's we often, because... When we do it, we're busy, we're too hurried, we're not taking the time to think about it. But when we hire people, especially the salespeople or the, the leadership people, this is one of the, the, the most crucial things. 
to structure and think about the bonus and also make sure that it's large enough financially that it does incentivize, right? Um, if it's just a 5% of, of, of the overall thing, then you know, it's, it's not really worth, worth caring or thinking about it. So that is probably for me and probably for Manfred as well, one of the biggest challenges that companies face is the communication with the HQ. Um, the second challenge that I would like to bring up, and it, it, it goes hand in hand with the discussion from today regarding the financial resources, is um, having a qualified Chinese accountant. Do not underestimate this. For some reason, people do not want to invest in the finance and administration side of their business. And it is extremely frustrating because this is where all the problems start and can start. How can you run an operation in China without having the visibility of what is happening in your books? Now, many of you will say, I cannot communicate with a Chinese account. I know nothing about Chinese gap. So this is not important for me. And from the HQ, we will have our own finance team do the books. You're going to have a US accountant, UK accountant, Australian accountant do China books. Do they know PRC gap? Do they know about the Chinese VAT? Do they know about customs regulations? Probably not. What are you doing using your HQ for a critical function in a business? I get very passionate about this because this is truly where a lot of the mistakes start from. I think, I think even going one or two steps back, um, finance is and will be a challenge with China. You know, If you look at it like a, a startup kind of going from zero to one with many, many, many variables and not being certain which variables will be how important, um, a lot of these variables will be under, under the finance system. Um, and, and that needs to work. And also, you know, on one hand side, you can be extremely expensive, but if you run out of cash, you're still broke. And if you, you know, don't manage to bring in the cash or get it from somewhere, you still have to give up, which a lot of startups, you know, can sing that song. And also the CPA or generally like the, 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 the people taking care of your finances, they're showing you the mirror. They're showing you the mirror. And, you know, we all know it's, it's, it's not a lot of things, right? If you build a startup, you need to monitor the cash flow. Correct. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And then you keep on going. And that is stuff that you, you simply need to pay attention to, you know? And again, it, it, it's not about the doing or not doing. It's how do you do it? You know, you don't monitor the cash flow in a startup once every six months. You do it all the time when you start. Once you have a feeling for it, you, you, you start stretching and spacing it. And here kind of coming, coming back to Christina, one of the reasons why I think she's a tremendous asset to, to people and organizations starting out in China is because she actually does that once a month. She talks you through to your finances. I don't know many people who either do that or can do that or want to do that from a business model perspective. Most of them say, you know, um, give me, give me, give me all your uh, invoices and everything, and I'll put it together and send it to you and I charge you for it. Which is fine if you already know what's happening and what you're doing, but if you, maybe you're still in the process of learning, having somebody who you know talks with you, having somebody who raises a question, having somebody who says, you know, but do you understand that we could, you know, be having this kind of service for only one third of the money that is useful. Huh? And I think that is important. Uh, and I think that is one of the, 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 the crucial challenges in you making China work in the first three years is, is to get the finances right. And also um, just to add that Christina said it in a different way before that financial planning starts long before you set your foot on the ground. Huh? Um, because, you know, again, we're back at cash flow, right? 
if you start having the first person or the first team or whatever, you want to think about having your own entity um, if you go a little bit larger. If you think about own entity, you need to think about register capital. You need to think about register capital. You need to think about your current financial reality and how much you want to throw in. And this is all, you know, it, it all is all connected. And this is preparation work that um, I don't think it's, you know, too complicated, but I would definitely suggest you do it with somebody who's done it, with somebody who can help you to at least talk it over. Um, because the problem is just, there's, there's too many problems and complications if you don't do it. Um, I, I, I just want to I just want to interrupt Manfred I think the key thing here is is that a lot of companies go the cheap way they want to minimize the cost of an accountant so either they will hire somebody they cannot communicate with but because they have a GM or sales manager they use that person as an interpreter why are you wasting that person's time as an interpreter they should be focused on the business that, that, that's hold on uh, the second is that don't hire a junior person who does not actually have experience dealing with certain things like VAT, VAT refunds. VAT is a very complex sales tax in China. If you don't, if you hire somebody who's junior, just newly graduated out of, out of, out of uh, school, and they don't have practical experience on how to deal with a tax bureau, how to deal with a bank, this gets you nowhere. In addition to that, most accountants, generally speaking, on a global scale, are the most non-sociable group of people in the world. It's a fact. In China, it's even more so. So you need to be as proactive as possible to talk to your accountant to give you the information. Another big mistake is you will get a financial report and you don't understand how it, the numbers have been plugged in because it's a different gap system. Now, your accountant will never say, hey, John, sit with me for an hour and I'll go through your P&L with you. They won't do it. You have to do that. You have to say to your accountant, hey, tomorrow, one hour, we go through the p and I don't understand anything. I want you to explain every single line item. This is a lot of work at the beginning. But the idea is that in six months time, you are familiar with how everything works, but these meetings last 10 minutes. Having said that, I still have a brother who lives in Hong Kong who I still have to explain after 18 years what VAT is and how it's calculated in China because there are constant changes, there are regulations. But <laughs> now it's secondhand and it's second nature and it's more me reminding him of how it works versus actually explaining physically how it works. But you need to know all of this to be able to help you with your pricing, to help you negotiate, to understand if you're gonna offer discounts, it's all these dynamics and you need your finance person to be a part of that conversation. Um, is there a third one, Manfred, that you can bring in before we start the Q&A? Absolutely. Um, we've, we've, you know, thrown it in already by, by, by now in between, but I think it really is people. Um, international business, my experience, and I don't need to go to, to China to kind of say the same thing is really about the people um, that that needs to work and it's not just the people in china is also uh, when you look at kind of our homepage and and our logo is that bridge it's the team or two people you know forming a bridge and and being able to work together that needs to be there you know it's the team it's the together and that needs to work and that is very easy to say and a lot harder to then actually do and, and maintain over the distance and over a couple of years. People is critical. I mean, I'm, I keep saying it and I've said it since, um, I, I said it less prior to the pandemic and I'm saying it now a lot more during the pandemic with the borders being shut. Um, I did 21 days of quarantine in December. It was not pleasant. Um, definitely don't recommend it. Um, uh, so if anybody is thinking of popping over to China for whatever reason, training or relocating or whatever, I would just refrain from doing this 21 days. Um, it, it really does impact you. But it has shown me that for my own business, 
I cannot run my business without the people that are on the ground in Shanghai and in Hong Kong. And that's just not, that's not only internal in-house employees, that's all of the third parties that I also collaborate with. I could not run this business without them and without their support. So they are the ones that are helping me to be able to scale up and grow the business. Um, I think I remember a lot when Manfred was doing presentations in the past around his project management. I think one of the key findings that he had from these projects was that there was never the right people in the company. And it could have been the sales manager. It could have been the, the, the operations manager, the production manager, the GM. It could have been the finance manager, whomever. There were always... The, all, the issues always stemmed from not having the right people within the, right, in, within the organization. So really, one of the things I want you to take away, and maybe also all of you that are joining in tomorrow's session, it would be wonderful if you could put pen to paper and write down who do you think you need in your ecosystem? Do you need um, in-house employees? What outsource providers? do you need to be able to sustain your business and grow your business? It'd be great to have that discussion after, after the presentation tomorrow, see what your findings were. Go ahead, Manfred. And also, you know, on that, on that people end, I see it with, with my own team in China. I see it with my team in, in, in Europe as, as we're a dispersed group. Um, it's actually not so difficult to see if it works or if it doesn't. Um, you sense a working team if all or if most of the things are running smoothly, if there is trust among the team to the team because they see, I can give it to Joanne because Joanne is doing a good job. I can rely on James because James knows what he's doing. You know, If that sort of behavior is there, you know you've done everything right. But when you always have, you know, uh, a problem, a bad, a bad gut feeling, um, when there's always stuff missing, when communication is not well flowing, or even worse, like um, Christina mentioned a couple of times, when there is no communication, because you hired people that you can't talk to, you know, those, those are sure telltale signs where rethink, rethink, readjust, rework, um, it's, it's, it's the right people. And it's also the right people, you know, in the, in, the, in the right places. A great accountant doesn't make a great sales guy. And a great sales guy is never going to be your best CFO. Um, it's, it's, it's those kind of things. But I, I, I strongly do believe, even if you haven't been living in China for 20 years, you will sense when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And most likely when you have that sensation, uh, you know, think about it, act on it as opposed to letting your local team tell you things that one plus one is 11 in China. It's not, it's two as well. Um, there was somebody who wrote, who wrote a comment that I just want to hit on. Um, they sent it privately. I, I won't mention any names. Um, uh, I just want to highlight that this problem from, from this person is related to bank accounts and the points of view from what the HQ wants and the points of view of what is needed locally. Um, I've just gone through this with a client this morning during the client meeting. Um, very often, out of comfort reasons, the HQ will probably want to work with a Western bank, purely out of comfort. It does not mean that the Western bank is the right bank for your business in China. And I've actually had a very bad experience with one such Western bank. So I'm very biased against Western banks in China, um, personally. Um, now, this person seems to be very frustrated by the HQ's reaction, and I totally get it. When we are discussing these challenges, a lot of them come again with this bridge of communication between HQ and China. And what I just wanna say is everybody needs to compromise at some point. It is a marriage and to remain happy once, to remain happy as a complete union, you will have to compromise occasionally, all right? 
So if your HQ is adamant because of corporate governance reasons that they have to use a Western bank and they're not willing to use a local bank, create a scenario that they can compromise on. So for example, having two bank accounts, which in your case, um, I just wanna to highlight to this person um, is a very good strategic move. It does not mean that it's actually something that's bad. All right. Um, we always need to create scenarios to make everybody semi-happy, happy in, 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 in these situations. So, um, and, I, and I like it because this person's based in Shanghai and I can feel the frustration that they are going through in relation with their HQ. And I completely understand that, completely. I get, I get it a lot. Um, but again, we need to create scenarios to make everybody comfortable make everybody feel safe and still feel committed to the Chinese market, okay? We don't want companies to exit the Chinese market before they've even gained traction because they're scared or there's a fear element or they wanna stop investing, okay? Um, so I just wanna to highlight to this person who's written in the chat privately about the bank, completely understand, but I would also say, don't be frustrated because what you've actually created could be very strategic um, with two banks. I think these sorts of challenges are, are abundant. Um, what I've seen working extremely well in the past is to find these compromises that Christina said. What I've seen working well as well is simply to, you know, give it some time and wait until something happens, which, you know, triggers discussions, which triggers insights and which then, you know, also leads in, in better ways. Um, but I think also if you if your position is in the local market, so to speak, in China, you need a couple of allies in headquarters. You need a couple of people in headquarters to discuss this with. And you know, just generally, I think it's easier to say, what do we need to reach this goal? As to say, I've got this and I don't like it, and I like that. Yeah. You know, if you're moving towards that goal and if you can, you know build good arguments that, you know, other banks or whatever, or other people or other products would support that goal, then I think it's easier to talk with, with, with the people in HQ, because from the local perspective, you need to keep in mind, there's so many things they don't know. It's not always them intentionally not knowing. It's just, if you haven't been in China, or if you haven't lived in China, and if you're now responsible for it, there's many things that you don't know. Your, your local reality in Europe is just different than, than the one in China. And I think that is something to, you know, see in an extent. So what you really need is a goal and a group of allies to, to move towards that goal um, with, you know, a big portion of flexibility in between. Um, but I think if you have the right people together moving towards that goal, um, then, then you'll, you'll manage to find a, a, workable, a workable solution. Yeah. I just want to touch on Antonetta's question about can a TP also serve as a, as a PO or employee of record vehicle? Um, because I think that's a, just an interesting thing about all the options that I created under business models. Can you fuse some of the options one with another? Absolutely you can. So could a distributor hire staff for you? As long as they say yes, yes they can. Could a supplier hire staff for you? Absolutely, as long as they say that they can and they're willing to do it. With these type of relationships though, for me, you are putting a little bit too many eggs in one basket, okay? And there are certain wrong scenarios that could be created. If, for example, you're putting an employee who actually should be discovering new sales channels but he's now sitting in the distributor's office and the distributor has control over what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis, hmm, that might not be so good, right? If you put an employee in a TP and actually the TP is not performing and you need to exit from them, how do you do that if they're hiring your staff? You get into tricky situations with these types of relationships. So as um, Manfred had written, it's sometimes better to separate the administrative measures. So I, I call hiring somebody an employee of record service as something that is an administrative thing. I would do that separate from the actual functionality and operation of your business. 
so that you're not playing too much together. I think as a as a principle in these sort of things, especially at the beginning, you know, try and understand what, what can I do to maintain at least a, a minimum level of independence. You know, if if you yeah. have that question in mind, then sometimes, as Christina just you know put it, that the administrative measures might be a little bit more, or might even cost a little bit more. But you know you have more flexibility for whatever scenarios are coming into play and and, and whatever is unfolding um, in front of yourself. If you if you put that all down to kind of one relationship, um, well, you really got to be knowing your man and 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 be right. protected, you know, against a couple of other odds. Um, yeah. All right, I think we're going to leave it there because we've already run over the hour mark. But I would love to hear what your biggest takeaways from today were. One word. What was your biggest takeaway? Manfred did highlight bamboo again for those of you that mentioned that yesterday. But if you have a different word that you can type in, um, let us know. Again, any feedback you would have with the content, again, let us know. Um, I did um go through all the points that were in the in the chat box so there's nothing that else that's popped in um if you guys are interested in a quick strategy session again i believe we've got well we still have three we've slots two, open. we've got two it's slots two we've got slots two open. slots left for next the first one's already been taken yep so, so uh, we've got two slots left um and i just want to reiterate a very good use of this quick strategy session and if you're having problems with your hq would be to bring in your HQ to these strategy sessions. And so, Manfred and I can act as intermediaries between the both of you to get the alignment that you might need. That is, that is one of the most useful functions of them. Then, then we use them as alignment sessions. Um, and that is sometimes where we as outsiders and experienced outsiders is easier for us to create that alignment, or at least to get people to understand that there is no alignment there at the moment. And to get the ball rolling, um, that's harder to do, especially it's harder to do kind of from the local market perspective. So that's one very smart way to use it as well. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So we've got two more sessions. If you are interested, I'm just going to write it in the chat box again. Um, Christina, Manfred, do you mind writing your email just in case? Absolutely. Please, absolutely. please do write to both. Uh, uh, I was my husband's name. Please contact Manfred. Um, not there yet, Christine. No, not quite. <laughs> um, please do contact, email both Manfred and myself um, into those emails. Um, and then again, this was the end of session two. Session three tomorrow will be all about um, having an empowering ecosystem um, to get the ball rolling even further. So if you haven't registered for that, woodburnglobal.com slash events um, to learn more on that. All right. Um, Manfred, anything you want to add? Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm looking forward to be seeing you tomorrow for the session on people. And again, you know, uh, that little impulse to everybody is already the second day of four days. I hope you've already put stuff together. I hope you've already put pen to paper. Um, do use the time not just to listen. Uh, do use it to actually move forward, create your action steps, um, schedule your meetings, reach out to us, um, go move. And uh, I'm looking forward to be seeing you tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.